Thank you. That concludes general questions. The next item of business is First Minister's questions. At question number one, I call Douglas Ross. <coughs> Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. And I remind the Chamber that my wife is a serving police officer. Serious failures in the SNP's centralisation of Police Scotland contributed to tragic deaths on the M9 in 2015. The deaths of Lamar Bell and John Yule were a tragedy that the Government vowed would never happen again. But this week, David Kennedy of the Scottish Police Federation said this, we might see more M9 cases appearing where people actually die. That's a harsh reality if there are not enough police officers. Under the SNP, police numbers have fallen by more than 700 since the creation of Police Scotland. How much lower will Hamza Yusuf let them fall? First Minister. First and foremost, uh, Presiding Officer, my thoughts remain with the families of Lamana Bell and John Yule, affected, of course, by that tragic incident on the M9 in 2015. In relation to the facts around uh, Police Scotland, let me, let me just remind Douglas Ross of a few important facts. First and foremost, uh, the SNP-led Scottish Government has increased police numbers since we came to power. They've increased uh, by over 300. And that means, of course, while we have increased police numbers, uh, we have continued to see more officers per head in Scotland than in England and Wales. If we look at the numbers per uh, 10,000 of the population, Scotland has 30 officers per 10,000 of the population compared to 25 in England and in Wales. Let me also address the point made by the Scottish Police Federation, made by Douglas Ross. We are investing in our police service. That's why we've invested £1.45 billion this financial year. That's an increase in the resource budget of £80 million. And let me remind Douglas Ross, as the SNP-led Scottish Government has increased police numbers, it was his party in 2010 to 2019 that decreased police officer numbers in England by almost 19,000. Yeah. Douglas Ross. I mean, it was a very simple question. How low will Hamza Youssef let the police officer numbers fall in Scotland? They have fallen by 700 since the creation of Police Scotland. And he speaks about investing. Well, the Scottish Police Federation said this. If the Scottish Government properly funded the police, then it wouldn't be bleak but they are choosing not to. Not my words, but the words of the Police Federation. And at the recent Scottish Police Authority meeting, Police Scotland officers described the cuts that they need to make as slash and burn. Deputy Chief Officer David Page said this, it used to be every pound is a prisoner, now it's every penny. That's why Police Scotland have been forced to launch a pilot where many crimes won't be investigated. I've previously asked the First Minister to come clean about which crimes would be overlooked, and he refused to answer. So will he now finally publish the full list of crimes that police in Scotland won't investigate? First Minister. Douglas Ross says that public services across Scotland are facing funding pressures. Of course they are, because of his party's yeah, economic I'm... mismanagement of the public finances. Of course an economic mismanagement, a torpedoing of the economy that Douglas Ross demanded that we copy. Thank goodness we ignored him, much like the people of Scotland continue to ignore Douglas Ross day in and day out. On the substance of the issue in relation to Police Scotland, let me make it clear once again to Douglas Ross that under the SNP-led Scottish Government, we have more bobbies on the beat compared to England and Wales. We have increased funding for Police Scotland by an additional 6.3% in terms of their revenue. And of course, what is important to people is ensuring that their communities are safe. And that's why under the SNP-led Scottish Government, recorded crime is at one of its lowest levels in almost half a century. 41% decrease in recorded crime uh, that we have seen since the SNP has been in government. So I'm not going to take lectures about the public finances from Douglas Ross when his party are the ones that have completely decimated this economy and decimated the public finances of this country. Douglas Ross. Another very straightforward question that the First Minister should be able to answer but refuses to do so. And it's not just police officer numbers that have been slashed. And this is important because the First Minister just said it's important that communities feel safe. 
Well, we learned recently that SNP budget cuts mean that police will have to close a further 30 stations across Scotland. Now, that's understandably causing a lot of concern in local communities who want to know if their police station is safe or not. So will Hamza Youssef be upfront and honest with people today, right now, about policing in their local community and tell us which stations will be closed? First Minister. Uh, first and foremost, uh, this is not news, of course, that Police Scotland published a document around their estates in 2019 uh, giving details of where, for example, they would seek to replace uh, some of their estate that was being uh, underused. Uh, and, and the reason they, of course, have done that is because uh, for modern, modern policing uh, purposes, it can often make sense to co-locate with partner organisations in modern, uh, well-equipped accommodation. But what people in Scotland are interested in is do, are there more bobbies uh, on the beat under the SNP government? There absolutely are. And in comparison to Conservative-led England or Labour-run Wales, we have more officers uh, per head. They want to know whether or not crime uh, is reducing. And under the SNP government, crime is at historically low levels uh, in, the last, uh, in comparison uh, to the last uh, 50 years, and 41% down since we came into power in 2007. And they also want to make sure that the police officers are being paid well. And I'm pleased to say that because of a recent acceptance of a very fair offer to police officers, police officers of every single rank are better paid here in Scotland yeah. than they are played, paid in Conservative-led England. So what I'll say very, very clearly is that we'll leave the operational decisions to police Scotland, yeah. but people right across Scotland should be in no doubt whatsoever that their communities are safer because of our investment and the SNP's investment in Police Scotland. Well, the First Minister flipped through his folder a lot there, but couldn't find an answer, which seems to be the only thing constant in this session, because Hamza Youssef is forcing Police Scotland to close dozens of stations, but he won't say where. He's leaving them with no option but to stop investigating every crime, but he won't say which crimes. And he's forcing the police to cut officer numbers to the lowest level on record, but he won't say how low. Now, for a First Minister that loves the sound of his own voice, it seems quite stark that he is silent when it really matters. Members. Silent on all of these questions. Let's, let's, hear just, Mr. Ross. let's just be very clear. Hamza Youssef is a criminal's dream. He doesn't want them stopped, he doesn't want them caught, and he doesn't want them in jail. Why is he being so sly and sleek it and secretive about the consequences of the SNP's cuts on Police Scotland? I think, Douglas Ross, I think Douglas Ross is just jealous because nobody likes the sound of his voice, yeah. I'll tell you, <laughs> presiding officer. Let, let us, I, I, know, I know the Conservatives are in their post-truth stage. Yeah, exactly. uh, a government yeah. that is, yeah. a UK government that is out of ideas and I hope uh, out of time very, very shortly. But let's stick to the facts because the facts tell us this, that there are more officers per head in Scotland than a Conservative-led England and Labour-led Wales. Crime is down under this Let's government. The First Minister. Officers, officers are paid more fairly, in fact are the best paid in the entire UK. So I know Douglas Ross, uh, despite having three or four or five jobs, I've lost count, presiding yeah. officer, was down at the Conservative Party conference this week, or as others have rightly dubbed it, the Conspiracy Party conference. His post-truth, his lies about the police service it simply will not wash here in Scotland, presiding officer. First, uh, first, first Minister, as all members are aware, it is wholly inappropriate to suggest that another member of this parliament has lied, and I would be grateful, First Minister, if you might apologise. I'm, I'm happy to call it an, an, a deliberate inaccuracy, Presiding Officer, because that's clearly what it is. First Minister, I must ask that you apologise, please. Happy to apologise to anybody who's been offended by the post-truths that have come from the Conservative Party and anyone that has been offended by my remarks, Presiding Officer. First Minister, I would ask that you apologise to myself and to this chamber. I'm happy to apologise to the chamber uh, for any offence caused, Presiding Officer. <laughs> we move on to question number two, and I call Anna Sarwar. Presiding Officer, this is actually 
This is actually a very serious issue because it is important to people right across our communities. Because earlier this week, when I was in Canvas Lang, I met a distressed woman trying to report a serious incident to the police. Her local station in Blantyre was closed, so she travelled several miles to Canvas Lang, only to find the station there was also closed. Our conversation was a heartbreaking example of what a loss of local policing means for communities. And soon people all across Scotland will be faced with the same situation. Police Scotland being forced to consider closing 30 stations. So when will residents be told which local police stations are closing? And can the First Minister tell us why he approves of these plans to decimate the police presence in Scotland's communities? First Minister. Well, I'm afraid that's just another inaccuracy, Presiding Officer. We haven't approved uh, the plans because we haven't, the Cabinet Secretary or I, haven't seen any finalised plans for the police estate uh, in Lanarkshire. I go back to the answer that I gave to Douglas Ross. Police Scotland's estate strategy was published in 2019, published for everybody to see in 2019. It outlined plans to replace outdated and underused properties and replace them, and that is the, the key word, with modern fit-for-purpose spaces, spaces uh, through consideration of a number of options, including uh, co-location with partner organisations. What people uh, in Scotland, what people in Rutherglen uh, and Hamilton West will be interested to in know is, are their communities safer? And the answer to that is absolutely, since the SNP uh, has, of course, been in government. They want to know, are there sufficient police uh, uh, bobbies uh, on the beat? There are, uh, I'm pleased to say, an increase in police officer numbers since the SNP uh, has uh, taken uh, power. So in terms of the, uh, any uh, changes to the estate, that is an operational matter for Police Scotland. What I'll continue to make sure is that Police Scotland is, of course, fairly funded. Anna Sauer. So, so that woman that had to go to two police stations and still not be able to speak to a police officer doesn't feel any safer. And I think that's frankly a head in the sand answer from the First Minister. But last month, the SNP's mismanagement of our police service was laid out in starker terms. Police Scotland say they'll need to lose another 600 police officers and 200 staff next year and 2,000 staff over the next four years. That's on top of the 600 officers already lost. Frontline officers are being overworked, missing out on rest days and struggling with their mental health. And that means in parts of Scotland, the police are piloting, not investigating some crimes. The Scottish Police Federation has warned people may die if further cuts go ahead. Their words, not mine. So why won't the First Minister listen to police officers serving on the front line trying to keep our communities safe? First Minister. We do listen to police officers uh, regularly, both myself, of course, the Cabinet Secretary uh, for Justice and Home Affairs too. And Police Scotland have already recruited almost 600 officers this year alone, around uh, just shy of 1,500 since the beginning of 2022. In terms of uh, police officer numbers, I go back uh, to the point I was making to Douglas Ross a moment ago. We have invested in Police Scotland. That's why we have more police officers here in Scotland than in England or indeed in Labour-run Wales. We also make sure that we invest in our police officers to ensure they're paid fairly. It's why they remain the best paid in every single comparable rank, the best paid in the entire uh, UK, certainly in comparison to England uh, and Wales presiding officer. So we'll continue to invest in our police officers and uh, in, in our police service. It is, of course, an operational decision for the Chief Constable who will determine how many officers they have in whatever role. I'll make sure, as the First Minister and the government that I lead, that we continue to invest significantly in police officers and, indeed, uh, in Police Scotland right across the board. Anna Sarwar. Uh, the First Minister may not choose to believe the police, but I believe the police when they say they're worried about their resources and the loss of staff. Mm -hmm. Because, Presiding Officer, the first duty of any government is to keep its citizens safe. And when police are telling you communities are going to be put at risk, you should listen to them. But this is the direct result of 16 years of incompetence and mismanagement from the SNP. When Hamza Youssef was Justice Secretary, the police were stretched to breaking point. The words of the SNP MSP that some on those benches sitting behind the First Minister wished they had elected as leader. Because policing, like our NHS, like every Scottish institution, is weaker after 16 years of SNP failure. Presiding officer, we can see it. The people sitting behind the First Minister can see it. And the people of Scotland can see it. So why can't he that it's time for change? First Minister. 
they, they, I tell you what, the backbenchers behind him certainly didn't seem to believe it, presiding uh, officer. Uh, what I would say is that when it comes to the facts, since the SNP has been in government, recorded crime is at one of its lowest levels in almost 50 years. It's down 41%. Since we have assumed office, the SNP have assumed office, there's been a 53% fall in robbery, a 71% fall in housebreaking, a 65% fall in the theft of a motor vehicle, 70% fall in vandalism. So there has been a significant reduction in crime right across a number of crime types. So what I would say to Anas Sawar is of course the funding situation of our public finances has been difficult, not because of the SNP, but because of course yep. complete and utter economic mismanagement by the Conservatives. The difference between Anna Sawar and I is I want to make sure that we have the power over our finances and he wants to keep them in the hands of the Conservatives, presiding officer. Question number three, Maggie Chapman. To ask the First Minister how the measures in place to tackle the climate emergency will also help to address poverty. First Minister. A fair and just transition to net zero uh, means aligning our climate action to also address existing poverty and inequality across Scotland. A truly just transition to heat decarbonisation can help to reduce fuel poverty uh, through measures such as tackling poor energy efficiency, which is why we're investing £1.8 on the heat transition over the course of this parliament. Additionally, our ongoing support for public transport, especially our work to expand concessionary travel to under 22s and our just launched peak fares pilot demonstrates we're already taking very serious action to both alleviate poverty, but also to cut emissions too. Uh, fairness and equity will be a key consideration in the development of our just transition plans. And we're working with the Poverty Alliance and those with lived experience of discrimination, poverty, and why did inequality to, to, to co-design these plans? Maggie Chapman. We have just had the hottest July on global records, then the hottest August, then the hottest September. Gobs backing the bananas temperatures, according to climate scientists. A bit like Tory party conference this week, perhaps. And of course, Scottish Greens know that the systemic causes of the climate emergency also cause poverty and inequality. This Challenge Poverty Week, can the First Minister confirm that the work we do to make this shift from a carbon economy to a renewables economy, with policies like free bus travel for under-22s, an end to peak rail fares and so on, are all vital to the twin missions of tackling the climate emergency and tackling poverty, and that such policies are instrumental in building the clean, green, equal and caring economy we all so desperately need? First Minister. I agree with Maggie Chapman wholeheartedly, and I think anybody who, of course, who pays attention to the science, which I think is most of us uh, in this chamber, will see, of course, that climate uh, injustice, climate action, the climate catastrophe, it does not, uh, it does not impact us equally. Uh, those who are poorer, the most vulnerable, those who live in areas of higher deprivation are impacted more greatly by the climate catastrophe uh, than uh, others. So it's so important that we, of course, have a just transition. I put an emphasis on that word, uh, just transition, to a low-carbon economy. That's absolutely vital in delivering our environmental obligations, but also, of course, our social and economic objectives uh, as well. So, as I've said uh, previously, we're clearly demonstrating that commitment uh, through, through policies such as the £1.8 billion investment in heat transition and, indeed, expansion of free bus travel. And we'll continue to make sure we make progress in meeting our ob obligations for the planet uh, and, and importantly also uh, for the people of Scotland too. Ivan McKee. Decarbonisation of our housing stock is critical to Scotland meeting its ambitious net zero targets. Yet residents are rightly concerned about the cost of installing new heating systems which will far outweigh any government grant support available and are often unsure about the range and applicability of the various technologies on offer. Does the First Minister agree with me that the most cost-effective way to decarbonise much of our existing housing stock may be through accelerating the deployment of district heating solutions, centralising much of the investment in technology choices and making the process of decarbonisation much easier and cheaper for homeowners? First Minister. Ivan McKee is absolutely right uh, in his question. Heat networks will play a very important role in changing the way <coughs> we heat our buildings. We, they could grow... Uh, to meet around 17, anywhere between 17 and 32% uh, of our heat uh, demand. It's also fair to say, of course, that it's going to be important for us to attract 
uh, private investment uh, into, uh, of course, our decarbonisation uh, journey. And that is something uh, that is happening worldwide. And we have uh, over the Atlantic, of course, the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, of course, over uh, to the east uh, in, in Europe, we have uh, the Green Deal Industrial Partnership. But unfortunately, we have a UK government sitting on their hands, not taking action, not helping us to attract that private investment. And that's why we continue to demand that we have the full financial powers yep. in order to, to, to attract that investment to Scotland to help us in our journey to net zero, presenting officer. Paul Sweeney. With an all-day bus ticket in Glasgow costing £5, I agree that free bus travel is both an environmental and social good. For people seeking asylum in Scotland who receive just £6 a day from the Home Office, public transport is simply not an affordable option. This challenge poverty. Civil society organisations are calling for free, free bus travel to be extended to people seeking asylum. So will the First Minister confirm if his government will deliver this? First Minister. It's certainly an issue that uh, this government uh, is uh, considering. And what I will say to Paul Sweeney is anything we can do within our powers to make the lives of asylum seekers easier, uh, of course, we will seek uh, to do. We, uh, Paul Sweeney knows well that we don't have uh, those powers uh, in our hands. They still lie in the hands of an inhumane uh, Conservative government. I met with an asylum seeker yesterday who will, has been in the asylum system for 12 years, 12 years presiding officer without the right to work. Uh, that, to me, is an absolute uh, disgrace, and I know Paul Sweeney uh, agrees with that. So, yes, I will consider uh, the proposals around uh, potentially seeing if we can seek to extend uh, concessionary bus travel. We do that with the real limitations in our budget, but it is something that we will give consideration to. Thank you. Question number four, Michelle Thompson. To ask the First Minister what support the Scottish Government is providing to Creative Scotland. First Minister. The Scottish Government provides significant funding to Creative Scotland each year and will continue to do so. In 2023-2024, uh, this financial year, this includes £27 million to support Creative Scotland's regularly funded organisations, £5.77 million for Creative Scotland's operating costs, £9.5 million for the Youth Music Initiative and £7.25 million for Screen Scotland and uh, £2.5 million for festivals too. Michelle Thompson. I thank the First Minister for that response. There are considerable challenges in the arts and culture sectors. They and the Scottish Government struggle to operate in a post-pandemic, post-Brexit, high inflation and constrained budget environment not of, a, of our making in Scotland. Nevertheless, the scale of funding for the arts and culture sector is comparatively low at around 0.1 per cent over overall budget. And the Scottish Government set out to stall in creating a well-being economy, and the arts and culture sector are one of the primary contributors to this ambition. Will the First Minister and his Cabinet Secretary redouble their efforts to make sure the sector can be supported by whatever means possible over what will be undoubtedly further challenges in the years ahead? First Minister. Uh, yes, I can. And Michelle Thompson makes some very important points in the question uh, that she asks. Uh, culture and the arts are important for, of course, the economic contribution that they make to this country, but they're also important for our, other reasons too. They can absolutely be, and they will be, part of that well-being uh, economy. We know, for example, when we think about social prescribing uh, in the health space, that they can be uh, exceptionally important. And of course, culture and arts are important intrinsically for their own sake and the joy that they bring to the people, not yeah. just, just of this country, but as we've seen, particularly over the summer, uh, to people right across the world too. So I can give an absolute commitment that even when our finances are constrained, and of course we will ask Creative Scotland, as we will ask other public bodies to do, to sometimes help and assist, and if that, is, and if that necessarily means uh, using the reserves, then we will uh, ask them uh, to do that. But we will look to support, as we have done over the years, our culture and arts, because they are so valuable to, to, to all of us in Scotland, and I would say valuable to the rest of the world too, President Officer. Donald Cameron. Thank you. Uh, last week's decision to reinstate a cut to Creative Scotland's budget of £6.6 .6 million not only represents the complete reversal of a commitment made in February by the SNP, but it has also caused irreparable damage to the trust placed in this government by those working in culture and the arts. Laurie Anderson of Culture Counts has described it as beyond disappointing, a massive knock in confidence for the sector. What does the First Minister say to her and to the thousands of people working in the creative sector who feel completely let down by the mixed messages and broken promises of his government? First Minister. It's astonishing for Donald Cameron to talk about broken promises 24 hours after his government scrapped HS2, uh, presiding uh, officer. Yeah. But also, does Donald Cameron never reflect? Does he never reflect when he stands up 
and asked us about the difficult financial circumstances we find ourselves in, that who have been the architects. His party have been the architects through their decimation of the public finances. Yep. And of course, it was Douglas Ross, his party leader, who demanded that we follow suit. Thank goodness we didn't. If we had done, we would have been facing far more severe financial pressure than we currently are. But let's, let me make it absolutely clear. Let me be unequivocal that every single regularly funded organisation will continue to receive the funding that they were expecting this financial year. There will be no detriment to them because we've asked Creative Scotland to use a portion of their £17 million reserves, a portion of those reserves, uh, in order to help us with the financial challenges and subject, of course, to parliamentary approval, will seek to restore that in the next financial year, presiding officer. Neil Bibby. The First Minister and Angus Robertson have claimed that a £6.6 million cut to Creative Scotland will have no detriment on cultural organisations this year. Yet it is quite obviously the case it will have a detriment of £6.6 million to the sector going forward. This Scottish Government promised in February to provide this essential funding, but has now broken that promise. The Cabinet Secretary has now given a gold-plated assurance that £6.6 million of funding will be given to Creative Scotland next year. Can I ask the First Minister to tell me what on earth this is assurance is worth when the last Government assurance turned out to be worth absolutely nothing? And how does the, this cut match with the First Minister's own words last month when he says the Government values the role of the culture sector? First Minister. Uh, Neil Bibby really should have thought about revising uh, his question after, of course, I already answered yeah. that very point uh, in response yeah. to Donald uh, Cameron. Because let me just explain it to Neil Bibby once again. Uh, every single regularly funded organisation will receive the funding that they were expecting this financial year. There will be no detriment to them because Creative Scotland, who have reserves of around about £17 million, are being asked to use a portion of those reserves in order to uh, in order to ensure there is no detriment and subject to parliamentary approval. Let's hear the first I hope minister. Now Neil Bibby's approval uh, that when it comes to next year's budget, we will make sure we restore that 6.6 .6 million back into Creative Scotland's reserves. Yeah. Presiding officer. Thank you. Question number five, Sharon Dowie. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the first minister what action the Scottish government will take to tackle the reported rising rates of crime and antisocial behaviour at retail premises. First Minister. Well, the latest recorded crime data for shoplifting does show an increase. The levels do remain below pre-pandemic levels. However, I do absolutely recognise the disruption, the harm that's caused to businesses from theft and antisocial behaviour. And Police Scotland and partners are taking ta uh, actions uh, to tackle and to reduce it. The Scottish Government fully supports the innovative Scottish Partnership Against Acquisitive Crime, which is led by Police Scotland and includes a number of other organisations, of course, including uh, retailers. Anyone affected by this kind of incident should report it to, to Police Scotland, who remain absolutely focused on keeping our communities safe from harm. Sharon Dowie. I thank the First Minister for that answer. I have met with various retailers in my area who have all discussed the challenges they're facing with rising crime and antisocial behaviour. This has escalated significantly over the last year and, in their words, is out of control. Police numbers are falling. Police funding is stretched and the government's approach to justice is not working. First Minister, what action will you take to protect retail workers? Yeah. First Minister. Um, well, what I would say to, to Sharon Dowie, obviously, uh, in relation to uh, her question, and I've said it to both Douglas Ross and Anna Sawar, is that uh, police officer numbers have increased since the SNP came in to government. That, of course, recorded crime has uh, reduced, and in fact, at one of its lowest levels in almost uh, 50 years, and we have more police officers uh, per head in Scotland than in England uh, and in Wales. So we'll continue to invest in our police service. It's also worth noting when you look at the figures that over the past 10 years, from 2013-14 to 2022-23, there's been a 3% increase in shoplifting. I was very interested in the interview uh, comments by Dr Sinead Fury of Ulster University. She's a senior lecturer in consumer management <clears throat> and food innovation. She said, and I'll quote from her directly, we've seen this before in previous times of austerity or economic downturn. The return of stealing to eat instead of being able to afford to eat is yet more proof that we need effective policy solutions that put sufficient income in people's hands in a dignified way so that poverty and resorting to crime 
do not become a mainstream means of securing the most basic essentials of living. That is not a quote from me, it is a quote from a professor <coughs> and an academic presenting office of the Conservatives would do well to listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. Question number six, Katie Clark. To ask the First Minister what assessment the Scottish Government has made of any impact of operational changes in the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service on response times to recent incidents, including the fires at Air Station Hotel and Kitty's Nightclub in Kirkcaldy. First Minister. As I said last week, uh, President Officer, I want to thank our emergency services and partners for their response to these incidents, uh, which were rightly an operational matter for Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. Both of these fires took place in derelict buildings with no risk to life. There were no casualties, thankfully, uh, and they were not a rescue situation. Uh, at Station Hotel, the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service deployed 15 appliances at the peak of the fire, and a decision was made not to tackle the blaze internally due to the building's structure and to ensure firefighters were not placed at risk. The SFRI, SFRS has confirmed that the recent operational changes <clears throat> did not impact on the outcome of the Station Hotel incident and the Kirkcaldy fire took place before any of the operational changes came into effect. Katie Clark. I associate myself with the tribute that the First Minister has made to our firefighters and he will be aware that the appliance at Kirkcaldy was taken out of operation at midnight later on the day of the fire. Is the First Minister aware of the serious concerns being raised by the Fire Brigade Union about the impact of withdrawal of 10 appliances last month, including the withdrawal of a specialist appliance at air, which they say meant local firefighters had to wait for an appliance to arrive from Castle Milk, given the Kilmarnock one broke down? Will he meet with FBU Scotland to discuss their concerns about the impact of budget cuts on public safety. First Minister. Of course, the Cabinet Secretary regularly meets uh, with the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service and I'm sure would be pleased and happy to, delight, uh, to, to meet with the FBU, who we have uh, the utmost respect uh, and regular uh, engagement with uh, too. In order to address some of the points that uh, Katie Clark has made, let me just uh, address the point around uh, funding, despite very difficult financial circumstances that have been well rehearsed. Uh, in this chamber, that we are providing the Scottish Fire and Rescue Service with more than £368 million this year. That's an increase of £14.4 million uh, in comparison to last year. We're also continuing to invest, uh, invest in firefighters up and down the country. And as of uh, March 2022, there were 11.3 firefighters per 10,000 of the population in Scotland. That's in stark contrast of 6.1 in England and 8.4 in uh, Wales. So we'll continue to invest uh, in the fire service, that we'll continue to invest uh, in our brave firefighters for the exceptional work that they do, and we'll continue to make sure uh, that where, of course, uh, that dialogue uh, needs to continue uh, with the fire service, with the Fire Brigade Union, we'll make sure that dialogue uh, does continue, because we all want to see collectively a fire service uh, that is well resourced and well equipped. Audrey Nicholl. Thank you. Can the First Minister outline what more can be done to take action against private owners who leave buildings derelict and at risk of antisocial behaviour, including fire raising, which has a significant impact on our councils and public services? First Minister. Audrey Nicholl raises a very important point. Uh, indeed, presiding officer, derelict buildings are a blight on our communities. They compose a risk, uh, as we've seen, to the wider public. The best solution is, of course, for owners to actually maintain the property or dispose of it so it's not a drain on our public services. And the control of dangerous buildings is primarily the responsibility of local authorities. And under the Building Scotland Act 2003, councils can serve notices on owners to carry out the work or they can secure the site and carry out the work themselves to make it safe, including, of course, right uh, up to demolition. Uh, the police, local authorities and the SFRS all work together to minimise the, risk, uh, the risks posed by derelict buildings, including, uh, uh, including uh, the fact that the public can, can also play a part by, by uh, reporting to Police Scotland, uh, SFRS, or indeed the local council, any concerns that they have over derelict buildings that don't seem secure. We move to general and constituency supplementaries, and I call Emma Harper. 
Thank you, President Officer. I'm sure the First Minister will have seen the No Life Half Lived report from Chest Arts Road Scotland, which makes a number of recommendations to enable access to rehabilitation support for one in five people in Scotland who live with chest, heart and stroke conditions, including in my South Scotland region. And just for transparency, I co convened a number of health related cross party groups, including the Lung Health Cross Party Group. Can the First Minister outline how the recommendations in the report align with the Scottish Government's Stroke Improvement Plan? First Minister. I did uh, read and I do welcome the Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland report. It's a challenging report and, and rightly does challenge government in terms of where we can and should uh, go further. And, and we will continue to engage, and um, Cabinet Secretary will engage with uh, Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland further uh, in relation uh, to their the report. Uh, we are committed to ensuring that people who live with chest, heart, and stroke conditions receive the best possible care. We have our stroke improvement plan that requires NHS boards to demonstrate provision of stroke rehabilitation in a variety of settings in a range of intensities. The plan also ensures boards must demonstrate a clear pathway for patients to re-engage with stroke rehabilitation services and offer a formal six-month review to everyone who has had a stroke, but I will end where I started planning officer, and that is to say that I welcome the report and will continue to engage with Chest, Heart and Stroke Scotland to see how we continue to improve the patient experience. Ros McCall. Thank you, presiding officer. Endometriosis 5 have advised me that the situation regarding waiting for gynaecological services in NHS 5 is appalling. Referrals for conditions such as endometriosis are having to wait over 63 weeks for treatment that's a wait of one year, three months, not three months promised by this government. First Minister, what is the Scottish Government doing right now to address appalling waiting times for my constituents? First Minister. Ros McCall is, of course, right to raise uh, this issue, and I'll ensure that the Cabinet Secretary for Health looks into the very specific matter that endometriosis Fife have raised uh, in relation to that particular health board. Of course, we do have uh, the Women's Health Plan, and we have made uh, ambitious plans, and do have ambitious plans, for reducing the far too long time it takes for diagnosis for women who do suffer from endometriosis uh, and other such uh, conditions. So I will ask the Cabinet Secretary for Health to write to Ros McCall on the very specifics uh, of the issue in Fife and see what more we can do so that uh, women in particular don't have to wait uh, long uh, for uh, access uh, to treatment, uh, access to diagnosis, let alone access to treatment thereafter. Richard Leonard. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the First Minister support the downgrading of the neonatal intensive care unit at University Hospital Wishaw, or does he agree with experienced midwife Elsie Snedden that this would not just be a disaster for Lanarkshire, it would be a disaster for Scotland? First Minister. What I tend to do is believe the experts, believe the clinicians, believe those in the third sector who have often worked with young babies uh, who young babies who often need uh, that uh, care and of course the model uh, that is being uh, placed here will ensure that we certainly believe and clinicians certainly believe uh, will ensure that there is uh, the best possible care for the sickest uh, babies and I'm more than happy for the cabinet secretary uh, to write to Richard Leonard to furnish him with the detail but as I say we, should, we are rightly being led by the expert voice of clinicians but also many of those in the third sector who also support these changes. Jackie Dunbar. Thank you, President Officer. The Peak Fairs removal pilot is another example of the Scottish Government's commitment to the role of sustainable transport, such as rail travel, in achieving our net zero targets. Can I ask the First Minister what this initiative could mean for emissions reduction? First Minister. It could be absolutely significant. We hope to have more people uh, on our railway uh, services, as I said, in response to a question from Maggie uh, Chapman, and I'm delighted uh, that uh, there has been such positivity uh, to this government uh, funding ScotRail uh, for that six-month pilot to uh, abolish peak, fair, peak uh, fares. Uh, and it's been welcomed by many people, of course, this week who have been uh, using uh, ScotRail, have been using our railways, and it is very much part, uh, part of the pilot and the evaluation of the pilot, <coughs> excuse me, will be to calculate the savings in CO2 emissions generated by removing car journeys from Scotland's road. And I think it is a, a very stark contrast, a stark tale, uh, presiding officer, of two governments. In Scotland, we have a government that's cutting rail fares. Uh, and, of course, the UK, we have a Conservative government that is cutting railway lines, presiding officer. Tess White. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. <clears throat> First Minister, further design faults have once again delayed the completion of the Baird Family Hospital and the Anchor Centre in Aberdeen. The projects are now three years late and over or almost £100 million over budget with costs expected to rise further. Has the, minister, has the First Minister met with NHS Grampian to discuss these deeply concerning delays and what financial support will the Scottish Government provide to the Health Board to ensure these much needed projects can go ahead? First Minister. Well, look, what I would say in the test way again, it is right to raise the, the challenges around these two projects. What I would say is the entire purpose of send, setting up NHS Assure was to help to assure all of us uh, in relation to capital projects that were being undertaken. And of course, those capital projects were meeting the high standards that we would all expect for all of our capital projects, but in particular for NHS uh, projects, much like uh, the Anchor Centre and the Baird Family uh, Hospital. So NHS Assure is doing its job. It has raised, as Tess White has rightly said, uh, some concerns and some issues which need rectified. Of course, the Cabinet Secretary will remain close uh, as we will, as a government, remain close uh, to uh, the Health Board and are more than happy to ensure that Tess White is kept uh, up to date in relation to those discussions. Carol Mockham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Yesterday, EIS members attended the Scottish Parliament with a letter for the First Minister. It read, and I quote, compulsory redundancies are already a reality in Scotland's college sector. To continue to allow the abandonment of the Scottish Government's own no public sector redundancy policy in the, first ed in the further education sector is nothing short of a betrayal of hard-working staff. Will the First Minister accept that compulsory redundancy are now a reality on his watch? And in this Challenge Poverty Week, can he explain how treating the college sector with such disdain is compatible with supporting it to continue being a route out of poverty for those living in our most vulnerable communities? First Minister. I can say, of course, uh, the government will respond uh, to the EIS uh, more formally and other uh, trade unions. But we've been clear, of course, these are discussions that are taking place between the employer and the colleges uh, and, of course, uh, trade unions. But in any discussion that the Minister for Higher and Further Education uh, has had, and he's communicated this uh, both face-to-face uh, -face, but also uh, in writing, he's made it abundantly clear, of course, uh, that uh, the guiding uh, light should be our fair work principles. These are principles that are important to me as First Minister, mm -hmm. principles that are important to the entire government. So I would certainly urge uh, those uh, college uh, principles, uh, those who are negotiating on behalf of the employer to make sure they do everything they can uh, to ensure that they are guided by those fair work principles. Lee MacArthur. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Orkney Islands Council has called for the Scottish Government's National Islands Plan to be scrapped uh, after, quote, little or no progress has been made on its 13 objectives, notably the inconsistencies in island authority funding and improvement of lifeline transport links. Uh, does the First Minister not accept that a more tightly focused plan would offer more uh, chance of objectives being met, rather than the Scottish Government continuing to overpromise and underdeliver for Orkney and other island communities? First Minister. Well, we've uh, invested significantly in our island uh, communities, and of course I'm always happy uh, to speak to the leader of Orkney Island Council. In fact, uh, we were uh, engaged in conversation at COSLA's conference just uh, last week. Uh, so, of course, uh, there, I don't think there's merit in scrapping uh, the National Islands Plan. What we have to ensure we do, uh, as a, from the Scottish Government perspective, is uh, make good on the commitments that are in that plan. And we're absolutely committed to doing that. And one example I'll give Lee MacArthur is in my last conversation uh, with uh, the leader of Orkney Island Council, uh, of course, reaffirmed the fact that the government is very open in the spirit of the Verity House Agreement in considering uh, models such as a single, and single island authority. Let's have that conversation. Let's have that discussion about what the art of the possible is. And of course, this government has made significant commitments when it comes to the funding and assisting of funding mm -hmm. to enter island ferries. Um, so we'll continue to, uh, to continue those discuss discussions, continue that engagement, not just with Orkney Island Council, but with all of our island local authorities too. John Mason. Thank you. The First Minister is obviously aware of the cancellation of HS2, or a large part of it, by the Conservatives, who are clearly only interested in London and the south-east of England. Will this have any impact on Scotland, for example, our climate targets, 
and the fact that it will be more difficult to take rail travel through and to England? First Minister. Undoubtedly, that will be the case. The Scottish Government has always strongly supported a high-speed rail programme that benefits Scotland, yet it's quite clear that this latest UK Government decision, this latest broken promise, will negatively impact on Scotland's ambition for net zero, for our economy, for enhancing our rail capacity, and indeed for our connectivity. We need to take time to fully understand the implications of the impact of the cancellation of HS2 and to consider the significant impact the cancellation of this project will have on our economy, but also, really importantly, on our climate change targets too. And it goes without saying that long-distance rail travel in the UK will now continue to struggle to compete with domestic air travel. This will not help us deliver on those important climate change targets that we must achieve. And I just reflect back on the fact that uh, during his uh, posting on, 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 on X, or formerly known as uh, Twitter, the Prime Minister put up a map saying that he'll be investing in the north. That map, of course, almost excluded almost entirely Scotland. I think it went up to, managed to go up to Stranraer and excluded the rest of Scotland. And so forget investing in Scotland. The Tories can't even find Scotland on the map, presiding officer. And Sue Webber. Thank you, presiding officer. First Minister, on the subject of rail travel, I've been made aware that ScotRail have made provision in their timetable for trains between Edinburgh and Dunblane to allow it to stop at Winchborough. When will Winchborough get its station, First Minister? First Minister. We have an excellent record, of course, in investing in the rail uh, infrastructure. It is remarkably brave of the member yeah, to stand up yeah. here to talk about rail investment. Yeah. And some might use a different word, presiding officer, but remarkably brave to stand up here 24 hours after the Prime Minister has scrapped HS2. So I will ensure Members. that the member gets the detail of our rail infrastructure. But as I've already said, as a tale of two governments, we have invested this week in cutting rail fares, while, of course, the Conservatives have cut railway lines right up and down this country. Thank you. That concludes First Minister's questions. Point of order, Stephen Kerr. Uh, Presiding officer, I didn't raise a point of order during FMQs because I understand it's the convention of Parliament not to do so. But in your exchanges with the First Minister, when he was asked to apologise to you and the member that he falsely accused of lying, he did neither. So what steps will be taken to tackle the First Minister's willful disrespect of your office and this Parliament? I thank Mr Kerr for his point of order. I dealt with the matter at the time, Mr Kerr. We will now move on to members' business, which is a debate in the name of John Swinney, and there will be a short suspension to allow those leaving the chamber and the public gallery to do so before the debate begins.